thanks so much, Tim, from this very, very cosy table. Uh, <laughs> welcome uh, to everyone. It's fantastic to be here. Uh, as uh, uh, Tim says, I'm uh, Kamal Ahmed, the business editor of the Sunday Telegraph. Telegraph Group uh, has very much made it its uh, job to support uh, those growth companies, particularly those at the small and medium uh, uh, sized end um, of the market. So it's fantastic to be here. We've done some brilliant work with Tim and the QCA and also many of the businesses uh, and sorry, the firms that are uh, backing uh, today's event. It's a fantastic panel which comes from almost across the financing piece. The one bit we're missing are the banks themselves, but I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions from the fine bankers in the audience about what a good job they're doing at releasing credit into uh, uh, the economy. Uh, Vince Cable uh, notwithstanding. Um, uh, so I'm going to introduce everyone on the panel, then there'll be a few sh short-ish words, five minutes, uh, uh, from each of our esteemed uh, guests. Um, to my far right is Lawrence Marsh, uh, analyst at Winterflood uh, Securities. Uh, to my direct right, Stuart Andrews, head of corporate finance at FinCap. Uh, on my direct uh, left is uh, Michael Infanti? Infanti. Infanti. Almost correct. Everyone gets my surname wrong as well, Michael. Uh, so we're in the same boat there. Um, uh, who is the CEO of One Media IP Group. Uh, recently uh, did a fundraising uh, via AIM. And on my far left, uh, Roberto Rivero, Head of Market Development, Standard and Pause. Now, the list I was given was given to me in a certain order. So I'm going to stick to that list. Uh, because it's always important to stick to lists uh, uh, when uh, an event like this. So I'm going to ask uh, Michael to kick us off with a few initial thoughts. Okay, do you want to stand over here because we've got a video. You can, from you can go and stand over there, you stand, stand wherever you like. Marvellous. Yeah. <laughs> we like to take some. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm Michael Infanti, the CEO and chairman of One Media Group IP. What I'm going to do is just run a four-minute video which tells everyone what I, uh, we do in IP. It's a lot easier than me standing here and explaining it because, trust me, at the end of four minutes, you still wouldn't know what we do. So if I can ask uh, the technical people to run our video. Here is one small British company's story set in the hardest of economic times. Our mission? To be a profitable net label. And so begins our acquisition trail of nostalgic music and video. During 2006, we pick our partners carefully, the orchard for distribution, and we list our shares on plus markets, raising a million pounds. The digital landscape is changing, and social media sites emerge as the darling of online gossip. It's 2007, and we really start to feel the buzz when two American music visionaries join our group, Scott from The Orchard and Mary from KTEL, both becoming our eyes and ears stateside. Amazon opens its MP3 store. Apple launches the revolutionary iPhone. This will change the way we consume digital entertainment forever. As we welcome 2008, performances by Icon Tina Turner, Pavarotti, and thousands of instrumental film and TV themes are added to the fold. A hot wind blows in from Scandinavia. We say hi to Spotify, another music industry game changer. In 2009, we report a maiden profit. One Media, the little net label, has made its point to the industry and investors alike. Thousands more tracks are added to the catalog as the company continues to reinvest in its content is king model. Hello 2010. Another good year for our shareholders, when One Media becomes eligible for VCT and EIS investments. Meanwhile, Apple introduces the first iPad. 
and just look at the roster of artists and tracks now in our library. Over 140,000 tracks. Hey, it's 2011 and it's a classical world. Music performed by the RPO and over 1,200 hours of other great classics from other orchestras worldwide. Oh, and that's me, Dave Cash, with my beloved Aston Martin, looking a little slimmer as the picture's a bit old. One Media let me loose on their music library, and over a thousand albums later, the Dave Cash collection was launched. All this digital content has to be stored somewhere, so we built our servers a home at Pinewood Studios for unbelievable uploads and bandwidth. But they all look the same. In 2012, well, iTunes sees our first 100 pop videos featuring the good and the great from the 60s. And then our eyes go square shape as we tune in to TV and acquire the early sooty shows and we listen with mom, who knows best as we know. And we release kid stories read by Rick Mayo, Lenny Henry, Judy Dench and Patrick Moore. Then a change of gear as we go all petrol head and lads mag and buy the Men and Motors channel from ITV Granada. 3,000 episodes of high octane fun. With smart TVs just around the corner, we launch our first 10 YouTube channels and watch our viewing figures hit 100 million minutes in year one. TV viewing has changed forever and we are there. So it's 2013, and if you're superstitious, we must have our black cat firmly in check. We invite our stockbrokers back for round two, and we move markets and trade our shares on AIM. They let him out in the city Where the streets have no name Everyone is young and pretty But they all... So what's next for us? The times they are changing with new digital mediums and more investment in content. Cars dumping the CDs and going online. Wi-Fi, Bluetooth and 4G delivering music and film wherever and whenever you want it. And behind some of this, little old One Media investing in its content, its IP brands and delivering it to its customers via 600 digital stores. Let's talk again in the next six years. And at that time, I'll bet we don't even need a computer. Okay. We're back on. Okay, thank you for listening and watching that. I was trying to keep our listing actually a secret from the uh, QCA, because whilst we were on Plus, actually, or ISDX now, sorry, uh, we were enjoying a 25% discount, I think, as being a member of the QCA. Um, Sorry, Nigel, my FD's here. We're going to get an increased invoice towards the end of this year. We're big fans of ISDX and ICAP. We listed with them back in 2006. If I was running a small business again, and we are still a small business, I would do so again. We are big fans. But what we needed to do was to grow, and what we needed to do was to widen our shareholder appeal. We needed our EIS and our VCT eligibility to be played out to a bigger market. So I was very keen to get institutional backing. And that was the main reason why we moved to AIM. It's been an interesting journey. Um, it's also been a journey whereby we race started in January and we completed it by April. So we did it in quite a tight um, time span. But a lot of the work, you know, if you've got a good team around you, you can do in-house. And we were able to present our professionals when they joined us with a complete bundle for them to audit, look at, and of course in the digital world, Dropbox plays a big part in the way that matters work. In doing so, and in being a small company, our market cap was two million prior to going to AIM, it's now just over six million. We had to make sure that the professionals we chose, the brokers, the nomads, the lawyers, the lawyers to the nomads and the brokers, and so on and so on, that first meeting we did with 23 people sat around a table was interesting when I was thinking, I'm paying them all. Um, what, what, what happens then is you have to get your quotes and cap the way that you go ahead at doing this float. We did so, we planned our expenditure, and it came in on target, I'm told, plus or minus 5%. 
I think that's good enough, as they say, for government work. Other than that, your non-executives have an important role. Sometimes we have to remind non-executives that they are not non-executives, they are directors. They carry the full responsibility of the directors, and I'm pleased to say that our non-executives do so. On the day of listing, we had the privilege of opening the market. There we were that morning at the LSE, cutting the ribbon or pressing the button, and that was a great honour. And also, for the first day of trading, gave us some, some fantastic PR. That brings me on to PR. PR is a very, very important part of this. The chemistry with your PR company, I felt, had to work. We chose a PR company that we get on with all the guys, and they've done a great, great job for us. We've achieved probably about eight or ten pages in national press along the way of this journey. That in itself has helped widen the shareholder appeal. <clears throat> Finally and afterwards, it's the autopsy. Sitting around the board meeting, my FD sitting there with all of the numbers, making sure that we came in on target, making sure that everything was right. Were all the professionals the people that we want to be working with moving forward? When we carry on our next fundraiser, when we go out on the road, would we change anything? Would we do things differently? The learning, the learning process is an interesting one. Most importantly now, we look forward to using our AIM currency in, in raising more money to further the business, to grow our business. A lot of our acquisitions will be overseas. The way that we work, it's going to be an interesting route. So thank you for you know, talking to me this morning. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, fascinating video and um, interesting story uh, from uh, you. Just, just tell me a little bit more. You, you, you obviously make the point about Plus Now ISDX and the move to um, AIM. What are the, the key differences for you as a business uh, uh, that AIM was a place you needed to move to? And is ISDX, in the end, going to be a competitor to that? I mean, that seems to be Michael Spencer's uh, plan for, the, for, 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 for how he wants to build that, that, um, uh, um, uh, that platform. Well, we saw it go through three name changes, from OFFEX to PLUS to, to ISDX. And as I said, if I was going to start a, a small company tomorrow, I wouldn't hesitate at using that platform. Um, where we did struggle a little, I think, was with institutional uh, backing. Uh, we did find that the sort of larger numbers that we're looking to raise perhaps wasn't going to be the right platform for us on ICAP. So we, that, that, that was probably it. Mm -hmm. What it did do for us, though, was give us a very, very good introduction to the way public companies have to run, introduction to IFRS, that's counting, and all the different ways that we should be running a public company. So for us, uh, highest regard for it, it was just a question of, of institutional following. Yeah. Fantastic, Michael. Great kick-off. Um, Stuart, if you want to take to the lectern or from here, whichever you fancy. I will do it from here. Does the mic work? Yes. Good. Um, well, I just guessed. I'm not out there, so <laughs> I don't know. People are nodding. Um, for those who don't know me, and I think most do, my name's Stuart Andrews. I'm the head of corporate finance at FinCap. For those who don't know FinCap, and I suspect most of you do, we are the largest nominated advisor on AIM with approximately 90-odd Nomad clients. And I think we're probably the fifth or sixth largest broker in London with about 112 retained brokership clients. For those of you who think I've become unnecessarily addicted to my iPhone, I've actually decided to go all mod cons and I've jotted down some notes on that of the things that I wanted to impart to you this morning. I think this is obviously very much a zeitgeist thing. This is the third panel session I've done in the last week on the availability of finance for quoted companies or technology companies or any other sort of company. Um, and I think one of the things that seems to be coming out of that is quite often there is a received wisdom. And the received wisdom at the moment appears to be that AIM is a terrible place, the market is dying, that if you're a technology company, the US is a beautiful place to be because people will literally just throw cash at you and wonder about it a bit later. Um, and that ultimately, you know, the banks, the equity, other sources of capital have all dried up. I think we actually see things very, very differently. Um, I haven't got a boatload of stats because ultimately, um, like most governments, you can prove anything with stats if I throw them at you long enough. But what I can give you is my gut feel for what I see day to day with the corporates that come in to talk to me and with the people that come in to FinCap to raise finance. I've just discovered the problem with doing this is that my phone turns off. <laughs> I think our feeling is that 
for food out there is pretty positive, and people are looking to raise finance. But one of the things that's very clear is that there is no absolute boom. You know, this isn't like the markets of 04, 05, 06. I don't think we're going to see that again. This is a steady market. It's a buyer's market. And funding is not cheap. I think market performance over the last year has been very, very helpful. You know, as you've seen the market make gains, you've seen more people prepared to trade, you've seen more money available to make investments into new things. However, one of the things I would say is that until we see a steady state market, one of the problems we have is not necessarily always the supply of finance, it's actually the demand for it. Raising finance is a long-term process on the public markets. And when you commit to it, and this is particularly true for the IPO world, you have to take a view on what the market will be like three months hence. And I think a lot of the time people haven't been taking that decision because they have been waiting to make sure that the markets remain steady. What we've seen over the last few months is numerous companies coming to market because actually over the last year we've seen gains and we've seen a steadiness to the marketplace. Ultimately, I think if you're an existing quoted company, access to capital is very, very good. And I think it's especially easy on the AIM market to simply go back and tap your shareholders for finance again. I think that's a very underappreciated tool. We've seen over the last few months, UtilityWise, which was brought to market last year, raise money. We've seen Lidco raise money. We've seen Amiga Diagnostics raise money. We've seen IdeaGen raise money, which was a plus market company. It raised 500,000 pounds at the start. It rolled all the way through and is now a 20 million pound company on AIM. There is financing out there for these businesses on the public markets. And actually, even if you can't access equity from the public markets, there are actually numerous other sources that are coming into being. We see loads more convertibles nowadays issued by the traditional fund managers. We see a lot more of the equity lines of credit, which may have a very dirty name, but are actually a useful tool for people. And I think the list of that keeps on growing, and we probably see at least one firm every week who are offering a gap financing solution, something to replace the banks. But what I do think is that companies looking for funds have to understand that out there it's a buyer's market. Whilst we might have lots of talk of very, very cheap capital, central bank rates are very, very low, the actual cost of capital to a small cap on the market is very, very high still. When people invest in an IPO, they expect to make a significant return. I think outside of the public world, you, know, you do still see a financing gap. Um, it's not something that I think we can all to hear, and it's not something I propose to talk about. But unless you're looking for a quote, I think there is a funding gap in the venture capital community, and I want to come back and tackle that very quickly at the end. In terms of the IPO market, I think there's some very positive trends. Um, ultimately, what are fund managers looking for with the IPO market? They're looking for exposure to something that they don't already have. And if I come back to my supply and demand, I think a lot of people would have seen the floats of Wandisco, Outsourcery, Blur, um, and three or four other Fusion X springs to mind, technology companies. And they filled a gap of something that wasn't currently available on the market. And that is going to be key. And again, if I go back to the supply and demand, as I sit in my office, we see no end of lookalikes for Wandisco, Fusion X, Blur, walking through the doors, looking for that next tranche of financing. So again, sometimes it's actually demand is only being sought out when there's a product to offer. I think in terms of raising money, the key is, as ever, avoid the nose. Again, buyer's market, if you go to people with obvious nose in your business when you look to raise finance, i.e. the border overpaid, the strategy is reliant on something that can't be delivered, you are not going to get your money. They're looking for robust businesses. The thing I want to tackle at the very end is ultimately an awful lot of financing in my world is dependent on tax breaks. In fact, nearly every business that walks in, one of the first questions you'll look at is, are you VCTable? Are you EISable? And if a business has those attributes, you can usually find money for it. So frankly, if you're quoted and you're VCTable or EISable, your chances of raising money are already considerably higher than an unquoted business that doesn't qualify. What I do think we need to look at is ultimately, if you go back to 99, 2000, the world was different, but VCTs actually had a much higher risk appetite. 
And if you look around the world now, the VCTs that invest, very few of them, and I will say there are some very big exceptions to this, very few of them, though, actually invest outside the public markets. That's a very big change. Ultimately, if I look at a lot of the businesses that have come to market in terms of IPO, they've been backed not by venture capital, but by private individuals and private individuals' money. I think the other change that we do see, and this, this goes back to tax and regulation, is the recent changes to a company's ability to offer shares to their own shareholders at less than 5 million euros without issuing a prospectus has been a very, very big move. And so ultimately, I did some work with the QCA. Prior to 2004, most companies would look to do some form of public offering along with the placing. After that, there is a complete dearth. And I don't have the stats available. Tim has them. It just literally fell off. With the change in the rules, I'm aware of at least four fundraisings we've done where we've put in an open offer element in order to increase the funding available. And it is very cheap and very easy to tag onto a circular. I've probably said more than I should do, um, but happy to take questions later. Thank you, Stuart. Yes, and we will have questions um, uh, after uh, the panel um, have spoken. Stuart, I just want to ask you a couple of things. Um, uh, firstly, you talked about the buyer's market and cost of capital. Uh, if you're looking forward over the next year to two years, do you see that relationship changing at all? And what are the reasons for that high cost of capital? And also, the issue around tax breaks, which I think is, as you say, um, absolutely essential. Uh, how consistent, um, and we had Lord Younger speaking uh, uh, this morning. How, how consistent is the government on its approach to um, uh, uh, listed uh, uh, small and medium cap businesses in terms of their uh, tax position? Um, t taking the first question, when do I see it turning from a buyer's market into a seller's market? I think not until you see a considerable appreciation in market levels you see a real return of private clients putting money into the market, which I think is changing but hasn't shifted nearly enough, and when we see fund managers chasing product. So I think the interesting thing is you actually see pockets of what I would describe as a seller's market. I think actually the Wan Disco's outsourcers of this world are currently in a, a seller's market. <coughs> Wan Disco's up 300%, outsourcery is up 30%. I've got the other stats here. Um, FusionX is up 126%. That must be a, buy, a seller's market. You, know, you don't get that sort of squeeze, but the market as a whole doesn't have it because it's not attracting sufficient capital. When do I see the cost of capital falling? I think that's a very different question. I think ultimately the cost of capital on IPO has always been very, very high. You know, the risks associated with an IPO are effectively that you're taking something that doesn't have a track record, and for that you actually demand a very high return. So traditionally, fund managers sought their discount to the market on IPO. So you wanted your 20%, 30% discount to, to where things were. Well, that's a very high implied cost of capital. And not only did you want that, but you expected it to perform very well in the aftermarket, outperforming what you could already buy. So I think the two things are different. Supply, I see a boom market when people come back to the market. Cost of capital, I don't necessarily see declining. I think it's always been high. Mm -hmm. In terms of government and tax breaks, um, I guess I'm not wholly on my own territory. Um, what I do see is that the way that VCTs have been constructed and the way that they now raise money, and I suspect this is quite controversial, is that effectively they are actually looking for much, much safer investments than I think people had ever envisaged VCTs putting their money into. So at the moment, as I say, a lot of VCTs are looking for smaller companies, yes, but smaller companies with defensible revenues, barriers to entry, dividend paying. Well, you know, John Morton is our chairman, and I'm pretty sure John would say that's not really venture capital. And so I think in terms of consistency, there probably comes a point where you encourage VCTs to stick with what they do, but you find a way of giving more tax breaks to encourage those smaller, more entrepreneurial organizations to come to market, if not earlier, at least with um, more support. Thank you so much, that's um, Stuart. That's very, very uh, helpful. Um, Lawrence, uh, give us some views from, from the market-making side. Right. Well, one of the problems of uh, <coughs> speaking uh, later on the panel is that uh, quite a number of the areas that you were going to cover have already been covered. But um, that's quite right. Uh, but I would... Um, uh, take up one or two points that Andrew said, and also I would um, uh, reiterate them as well. 
the uh, if you look at the AIM market, it, it's it's 18 years old now, and it's, uh, so it's, uh, it, it started off in '95 uh, with a lot of skepticism initially, uh, particularly from institutions. Gained momentum in the mid sort of uh, mid '90s and really raced towards 2000, and then. Funnily enough, actually came back quite strongly uh, after the uh, technology crash and peaked around about 2005 when I think we had something like 500 new entrants in one year. Now, from that time, we, we've sort of gradually declined and it's a, a pretty sorry state at the moment. Uh, and the number of uh, new entrants last year, I believe, was about 70. Uh, this year, I think, um, it's probably running on a similar sort of uh, number at the moment. And certainly the the amounts of money being raised is uh, considerably less than it has been in the past. And what has happened is the market, the overall number of companies trading on the market has shrunk from the peak of about 1,700 to I think about 1,080 at the moment. And over the last few years, there's been a terrific interest in the resources sector. And consequently, a lot of the new entrants and the areas of money being raised has been for resources. So you've got a very high level of resource-based companies on AIM. Now, they don't necessarily uh, totally dominate it, but there's a very large amount. There. So you've got a market that has shrunk in size with an area uh, that is entering a period of extreme volatility as people's view of uh, uh, resource prices and uh, funding is, is, is changing. Uh, so what I think uh, needs to be done, AIM needs to be reinvigorated. It needs to uh, look at the future, look at the areas of uh, industry that are growing. One of them, uh, area that um, Andrew picked upon was the couple of uh, companies that have floated in the last year that have been particularly successful, the One Disco and Outsourcery. Those companies are both addressing um, areas of technology industry, uh, such as cloud computing and uh, what's known as big data. And these are areas that are, have come about really with the growth of uh, digital media from Michael's business uh, along the uh, table here, and also from the growth of uh, mobile computing uh, with Apple. Um, this area is undoubtedly going to grow very, very strongly and very significantly. And I think this is an area that needs to be uh, looked at and to find are there companies that are uh, needing capital in the UK and growing on the back of this area? Uh, do we have the right marketplace to welcome them? And if not, what do we need to do to make it attractive? And we need to get some excitement back in the market. I feel that the, the market is, is uh, of aim has stagnated. You've had a lot of um, uh, companies that uh, have uh, uh, come to the market in the last few years have been resource-based. Initially, there was a lot of euphoria because you had China buying up every bit of resource in the world. And that has changed now. Some of these companies now may have projects that stretch out in the future that might have difficulty being financed. So I think we need to look at AIM. It needs to be reinvigorated and to ensure that we have the right marketplace to have the platform for the what I see as the new age of companies that may hopefully come to our marketplace in the next few years. If you, just to take a, a, a couple of statistics, um, in the video from uh, Michael's uh, very interesting business, and it's actually grown a lot more since I last met you, Michael, as well, um, Apple, which is a phenomenal company. We all know how many, uh, you know, the ubiquitous uh, iPhone, but some statistics recently, they have uh, a base of, um, I believe, in excess of 500 million iTunes accounts. That is accounts of people where they have the credit card details and people that have bought and regularly buy apps, downloading bits of music, whatever, from their system. And it's growing at half a million new users per day. That has opened up enormous opportunities for many other businesses to grow on the back of that, to provide services, to create apps, uh, and what have you. Many of those companies will need finance, and hopefully we'll want to uh, join some sort of uh, marketplace at some stage. Let's ensure that AIM is the right marketplace for that. Fantastic, uh, Lawrence, thank you very much. Well, would you, would you, why has there been this strong uh, decline? Are people just um, uh, nervous about the, the, these, some might describe as onerous needs of being a listed uh, entity? Yeah. And 
you've said about AIM reinvigorating itself um, to become more attractive. Uh, what else needs to be done? Is it by government or, or the businesses themselves to encourage them onto uh, the markets if you think that's the place they should be? Well, I think AIM went, uh, AIM grew very strongly uh, 2002, 3, 4, 5, and you had a period in the middle of uh, that decade where there were a lot of companies that were uh, being brought to AIM, very large entities, uh, I think you call them special purpose vehicles, that were raising pools of money to make further investments, particularly property, some of them in Europe, and especially as vehicles like that. I felt that wasn't the real aim, if you like, of aim. Sorry for the... <laughs> and it got some very bad publicity. And, and yeah. they tended to go wrong after yeah. a couple of years. Institutions, I think, lost a lot of money. And as with many things in life, one tends to look in the rearview mirror in that what hasn't worked will always continue to be the case. And so that when AIM underperformed for a period of time, I think it became somewhat dismissed. Uh, and as someone else mentioned earlier on, it's a bit of a dirty word to some areas at the moment. It's a shame. AIM really was a marketplace for early stage young entrepreneurial companies that needed access to funding to take them to the next stage to develop their product or develop their marketplace or whatever. And I think it was some slightly spoiled. Um, so I think we've got through that. We're still suffering, I think, from that to a degree. You then had the um, huge growth in the resource sector, which is all be almost became a mania, I think, in the last uh, two or three years. Now that is really, um, as sometimes mania tend to do, they, it's blown up. Uh, and what you're left with is a almost like a stagnant lake. And what you need is some fresh flow of water coming into it. So we you need new entrants to. Uh, and, and that will actually take some of the uh, interest away from the areas that haven't performed in the past. So technology, I believe, is it, because that is an area that is changing our lives. It's growing very rapidly. Um, mobile computing is, is having such a big impact. I mean, Michael clearly showed in the, in the um, digital media area the growth of that. Um, one of the companies that um, I think uh, FinCap were involved in earlier this year, Cambridge Cognition, they had a very interesting update today uh, talking about um, they have developed a, uh, a product which is um, run through the, uh, the Apple <coughs> iPad system for uh, testing people that uh, are showing a susceptibility to develop uh, Alzheimer's. Now that's getting quite wide acceptance in um, local health authorities now. And that just shows you one area where technology has been applied to many areas of industry, and that is going to grow exponentially. So that is the area, I think, the type of companies that we should be looking for to get onto the AIM market, because that will attract a very strong uh, institutional and retail interest, giving them a chance to invest in new areas of technology. Um, I think the retail market um, is still there. Uh, we can see that by the volumes that we do. I think they... Um, I think more could be done really by the government to um, on tax breaks. We mentioned tax breaks earlier. Um, the, why, why couldn't we have a system whereby if, if someone bought a company that was on a market such as AIM, which we know is a market that is uh, appropriate for companies that are going to grow and, and create jobs, so that's very important to the economy, maybe there could be some sort of tax benefit in that if they made uh, a investment buying actually on the market rather than uh, a new issues of stock, where if they held it for perhaps over two years, or maybe even one year, there was then a tapered relief on a capital gains tax, or maybe even no capital gains tax, something like that. I think more could be done at looking at that area. It's not an area I have uh, any expertise in, but I think that's, uh, it's, it's good that um, stamp duty is going to be um, uh, uh, removed from mm -hmm. next year, and they're still, I believe, consulting on the possibility of putting um, uh, AIM stocks into one's ISA. But I think some sort of capital gains uh, benefit wouldn't go in this as well. Thank you so much, um, Lawrence. Um, Roberto, uh, I think you were going to speak from uh, the lectern, uh, from the uh, point of view of uh, credit rating um, and uh, risk uh, for smaller businesses. Good, good morning. Yes, uh, away from the uh, world of equities, uh, 10 minutes on the world of debt. Um, in the UK, business lending has shrunk by 20% over the last four years. Uh, the chart on the screen is from The Economist. Uh, they're using data from the Bank of England. And, and the line that's plunging towards the bottom right-hand side of the chart is uh, business loans. Uh, 
this isn't uh, just happening in the, in the UK. Uh, in most European countries are seeing uh, bank deleveraging and a, and a reduction in bank lending. Uh, the, this data is from uh, the European Central Bank. The red bars are uh, net lending to the corporate sector. Uh, and as you can see, a huge reduction uh, from the peak in 2006-07. Uh, and going into te uh, negative territory last year and this year. The, um, uh, sometimes the world of finance behaves uh, a little bit like a balloon uh, in that you squeeze one end and you see an expansion somewhere else. Uh, and to a certain extent, we're seeing that right now. We're seeing a squeeze in bank lending, uh, but we're seeing an expansion in other areas. Uh, one example that's uh, gained a lot of publicity recently is the London Stock Exchange's bond trading platform, uh, where uh, they've set up to, um, to tap the retail investor as a source of finance. Uh, and on Monday, they announced that they've raised £3.4 billion uh, over the last three years. Um, another example, uh, a, a far bigger example, is the world where uh, institutional investors pension funds, insurance companies, fund managers l are lending directly and privately to corporates, uh, the private placement market. And uh, the chart on the left shows the growth of that market in the US. Last year was a record year, $55 billion was raised uh, in the US. Uh, the really shocking thing is that 40% of that money, uh, another record, 40% of that money was raised by European companies, uh, which I think highlights the problems that European companies are having raising money at home. And, <clears throat> and when you rank the countries that went to that American market to raise funds, uh, the UK comes uh, top of the list. On the right-hand side are the European equivalents. Uh, they're smaller, but they're growing faster. Uh, and last year, they helped to raise uh, another $20 billion. Uh, a, um, Standard & Poor's is well known for its ratings, uh, but uh, some people don't realize that we actually publish a lot of uh, research. In Europe, we have 500 analysts that comment on <coughs> many aspects of the economy. And uh, on this particular topic of a reduction in bank lending and uh, and its effect on different parts of the economy. We have been uh, pu publishing research since 2009. Uh, some of it uh, is outside, uh, if you're interested in, in picking some of that up. Um, <clears throat> uh, because of all the change that's taking place in the capital markets, um, and, uh, and due to some lobbying uh, by Tim Ward, uh, about a year ago, we started to do some research into uh, the mid-cap sector, um, looking at mid-sized companies and, um, and their options for, for funding themselves. Uh, we, as part of that, we met with 250 organizations. Uh, the majority of them were either mid-sized companies themselves, several members of the QCA, um, investors who are active in that market, uh, and the intermediaries that, that helped to bring these two sides together. Um, and if I had to summarize what we heard in those meetings into two bullet points, uh, the first one would be that a confirmation that banks are rationing and repricing debt. Uh, and the second one, that um, having experienced that directly uh, or in anticipation of experiencing that directly, uh, these companies are very busy uh, diversifying their sources of funds. And, and looking at these alternative markets uh, like, the, like the Stock Exchanges Initiative and the private placement market. Um, because of the change in the markets, uh, because of uh, you know, all the feedback that we heard in those meetings, you know, all the stories about companies having trouble raising funds from their banks, uh, we uh, developed a new product, uh, which we launched yesterday uh, at an event featuring Vince Cable. And the product is called Mid-Market Evaluation, and it's specifically designed to help mid-sized companies tap these private institutional markets. Uh, 
for our purposes, uh, our definition of a mid-sized company are companies with revenues of less than one and a half billion euros and debt less than 500 million. And we're excluding from that uh, leverage buyouts, uh, financial companies, uh, and utilities. Uh, since we only have five minutes, I won't take you th uh, through all the features of the product, but I will just say um, it's not a rating, so it's not designed for, for companies to raise funds from the public markets. Um, but uh, all of the feedback that we heard in our meetings uh, from investors and from intermediaries uh, points to the fact that companies will find it useful to raise money in the private uh, markets. So, something else that came up in our research was that um, when we spoke to corporates, uh, they had a perception that uh, in our ratings we had a bias against smaller companies. <clears throat> we don't. But we do, we do have um, some criteria um, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, we, where uh, size comes into play. Uh, we look at things like um, diversification, uh, uh, how much market power a company has uh, in, in its own niche. And of, and of course, it tends to be the case that the bigger you are, the stronger you are in those areas. So as far as this particular product is concerned, we've taken our corporate ratings criteria We've adapted it for mid-sized companies, uh, and we're comparing mid-sized companies against each other. We've also um, stepped away from our traditional rating scale of AAA, AA, single A into a purpose-built scale for this market, which goes from MM1 at the strongest end uh, to MM8 um, at the bottom. And um, <clears throat> uh, one aspect that every investor told us was important uh, was that we should take a look at um, uh, recoveries. If an investor uh, in, uh, makes an investment in a small company that he can't walk away from, he's very interested in the um, what will I get back uh, in the case of default. It's a, it's a sort of what if, and we give an indication of that. Uh, so. <clears throat> this particular feature has been very welcomed by the investment community. So uh, just to round off, we think the product will bring be many benefits to the market. Uh, for investors, we think it will help them to supplement their own research and benchmark their analysis against uh, the outside world. Uh, <clears throat> we think we're bringing comparability to this market so that an investor can look at, can compare the credit risk involved in, in um, different investment options that they may have in front of them. And thirdly, uh, we think that by bringing a, uh, cr a credible third party opinion uh, to, to the investors, um, we, we will help them with their process and, and, their, um, and their decision making. Intermediaries have told us that uh, the product will help them uh, uh, speed up the process uh, and, and perform a better job for their clients. Uh, and finally, and most importantly, uh, we think the product will help mid-sized companies tap these new sources of finance, uh, and, it, and it will help to promote more competitively priced lending. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Roberto. A, a fascinating um, new product you put out. What, what pressure do you think you'll be under for listed entities to actually um, uh, have to make those uh, uh, ratings, well, not quite ratings, those analyses, analyses that you're doing public? Will there, not be a, will, will there not be a pressure on you? This notion of having it shared among some of the investment uh, community might become difficult. Yeah, I should have said that the, um, uh, although the product is private, uh, our client, the mid-sized company, has control about uh, the distribution of that product. So I, I meant non-public in the sense that unlike, uh, with our other ratings, we publish them, they're freely available on a website. With this product, the um, mid-sized company will retain control about the distribution of the, um, of the report and, and of the, um, the, the, the score that they're uh, yeah. at. Uh, what's interesting, I mean, we, we've covered this area um, regularly in the Telegraph, is that many um, medium and smaller uh, businesses find themselves in something of a, a sort of credit ratings lottery and get very, very different types of credit ratings dependent on who they go to. And we, we've covered 
um, uh, various issues around here. I mean, is, is that an issue you find um, uh, with small and medium uh, businesses, that there's a lack of consistency in how the present credit rating um, organisations are, are actually dealing with um, uh, them for the purposes of financing? No, I think um, uh, the, the big three uh, agencies have very consistent methodology about uh, how they, they go about rating companies. Uh, however, one, one um, aspect in which there is consistency is that um, most, no company is pleased with their rating. If you tell somebody that they're a double A, they th think they should be a triple A. Uh, so contrary to the um, aspect that, you know, to, 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 to the reports that we give our clients a good rating to flatter them, um, that, that isn't the case. Mm -hmm. However, uh, investors often say that the um, additional transparency that we bring, and, the, and, the <coughs> and it, it's not just about the letters that, that go along with... Um, with the score, it's about the report that lies behind that and, and gives the investor um, a summary of what the company uh, is into its situation and its strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And as Rodgers, finally, um, uh, you obviously put some uh, the figures up about um, um, the supply of bank uh, credit. Mm -hmm. G given uh, the points you've made about um, alternative um, models, bond trading, um, private placings, um, et cetera, does it matter in a way that the politicians have said it does that, that bank credit uh, has been reduced? Uh, it, it definitely matters, the, especially in Europe where the majority of companies get their funding from banks. In, in, in Europe, something like more than 70% of debt funding comes from banks and the rest from the capital markets. Uh, in the US, it's the other way around. Mm. Uh, and there's been a long time trend where Europe is moving towards the US. I expect the shortage in bank lending will accelerate that, but yes, it's, it's significant. You know, it, bank lending is um, trillions, and, um, and the alternatives, and, and the alternatives are, alternatives are only yeah. billions. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Roberta. Well, look, fabulous, about 50,000 issues raised. Um, let's all raise our hands uh, for those loads of questions that are going to kick us off uh, or get, get, get this discussion going for the next 20 minutes or so. Um, uh, I'm looking eagerly for the first hand to raise to ask the first question. That gentleman there uh, wins a prize, which Tim will give you uh, a little bit later. Um, uh, and the second question will come over here. I, I, I think there are microphones. You can stand up, sir, uh, give your name. Uh, and maybe um, uh, one sentence on, on, on your business or whatever it is you may do. Uh, my name is Edward Beale. I run a small company called Citigroup that's nothing to do with a big American bank. We help micro caps with the extra things they have to do because their shares are publicly traded, help reduce reputational risk for directors, um, and primarily in the uh, company secretarial and head office finance area. Um, my question today is on this, this new standards and boards rating. Um, does the panel think it's going to be price-sensitive information that can't be disclosed selectively and must be published more widely? Well, sort of my point, but much better asked. You should be up here, actually. Um, uh, uh, Michael, I mean, presumably, if you're given this fabulous new little bit of information or big bit of information from Standard and Poor's, you're going to be, uh, you will have a duty to, uh, to publish that. Yes, indeed. But I'm listening with interest, what Roberto was saying, that... Uh, if a company is given a, triple, a double A rating, they think they're worth a, a triple A. I think it's probably the same with any CEO and its valuation of his business. <laughs> the moment he's given a, a rating, you know, I think Warren Buffett once said that uh, you know the, the exchange is a voting machine ultimately, and then it becomes a weighing machine. And I think anyone's rating and anyone's valuation is always going to be questioned. Mm -hmm. And you think that if you had to get information like this, you would have to, as a listed entity, publish it. Yeah, I mean, we, 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 we're a transparent business. I mean, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, everything, right the way down to director salaries are now published, everything is available. Mm -hmm. I think if you're in the public arena, information should be public. Yeah. I mean, Stuart, do you agree with that? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's because he earns bigger wages than us poor people in industry. I wish. Um, I, I guess there's two issues. Number, number one, I guess, is, is the whole area of do I think something like that is price sensitive? Um, we're back to does the opinion of one particular entity about the creditworthiness of another entity establish something that's price sensitive around the equity securities of that business? In some situations, I guess, yes, it would. And in other situations, I guess, it probably wouldn't. 
But again, I think if you look at the stats, when someone has their debt downgrade, if the equity doesn't plummet, unless it's a massive downgrade or the debt is so questionable that the equity shouldn't be worth anything. So I guess it's probably horses for courses on that one rather than establishing an absolute. Do I think businesses generally should be transparent about how people view different classes of their, excuse me, classes of their financing? Yes, I do. Excellent. Lawrence, what, do, you, do you agree or disagree with the notion that whatever the fine people at Standard & Poor's uh, produce will ultimately need to be published? I think so, because Standard & Poor's has such a high uh, um, uh, reputation and image in the world that um, if it was found out, and usually things you know, do leak out at some stage, if it was found out that there was something that was perhaps uh, downgraded, um, the market would take that extremely severely, I would have thought. Uh, it was almost as if the company was trying to hide something. So, um, my email is at the end of my column every weekend, if anyone does want to get in contact with me. Can I just pick up one yes. other thing? I, I, I should have said that the reason it's uh, not public is because every sing we spoke to public and private companies, and uh, uh, probably... Um, 50% uh, of the public companies said it should be a private product, that they didn't want any mm -hmm. more transparency into the business. But 100% of the private companies we spoke to said that they didn't want it to be public. They didn't want it to be published. Yeah. Uh, and since this product is not just for listed yes, companies, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. we decided to. Um, yeah. it, uh, a, a, very, a very good point was made about uh, it's just one company's opinion. Uh, and. I should also point out that sometimes companies do things which are good for the shareholder and bad for their debt holders, or vice versa. So just because you get an upgrade in the rating, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to see uh, a, a, an increase in the share price. Mm -hmm. It could go the other way, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and vice versa. Yeah. Excellent. So, so what, what do you think? Ah, you're giving back the microphone too, too quickly. Uh, my instinctive reaction is that uh, because of the reputation of Standard & Poor's that uh, the existence of the rating uh, will impact on the judgment of the people who know about it um, and that uh, therefore it should be disclosed if you are a public company with, uh, with a rating. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, there's a gentleman down here. Uh, great, next for the question, and then there's a gentleman on the table next to him. And Tim, I might come to you on that question. My so, name's Donald Stewart. I'm, I'm on the board of the Quoted Companies Alliance, but I'm also a director of a small AIM-listed company called ILX Group, which does e-learning and training. And my question on the stand, new Standard & Poor's product was, how is it funded? It presumably... Um, arises because a company asks for it to be done, does that mean the company's paying for it? Yes, it, it's the same uh, business model as our, our ratings product. Uh, the borrower or issuer uh, pays for the, for the, for the product. Does, does that mean it's um, defined as independent within the, the current regulatory regime if it's funded by the company? Uh, well, the investors uh, think we're independent. And, uh, and all those clients who don't get the rating they think they deserve can see that we're independently minded. And is, is it on invitation? Or how, will it, how, how will you, you know, get a, a wide, across the waterfront analysis of different businesses? They will invite you in to come and do this yes, piece of work. Yes. yes. Uh, I mean, typically we get approached uh, either by the company or their advisors when the company get, uh, begins yeah. the process of raising debt. Yeah. Tim, could I just ask you what your thoughts are on, on this new product uh, for uh, listed entities, but of course, as Roberto says, it's also for uh, uh, private entities, about things like publication and, and, and w will it improve um, the way that investors can, can view uh, smaller businesses? I think it's, uh, it's got to help uh, companies generally. I think the more information on companies, the better. Um, I saw a statistic recently which said that 40% of publicly quoted companies worldwide don't have any coverage on, them, on, on the companies themselves uh, at all. Um, and I think anything that comes into the market and offers an opinion, offers a view, 
summarises the story, encourages the story to be uh, disseminated, has got to be good news. And I think the public debt market is something that public equity companies should be very aware of. And they should, if they can, and they get to a certain size, they should be looking to access it because it creates, as Roberto says, competition in the, in the debt market. And it means the banks wake up and perhaps you're not quite so wedded to the banks. Do you think there'll be pub pressure on publication? For um, publication? I, th I think there will be pressure on publication, but I think as Stuart says, and Stuart said it much more eloquently than I can, I think it is a horses for courses because I think it does depend on a company's own circumstances. Excellent. So, a gentleman on this table uh, here. Who's next? Gentleman right here. Fantastic. Uh, sorry, sir. Yes, sorry. So sorry. I'm confusing everyone. Thanks. Um, on a discussion on availability of finance, um, isn't one of the great handicaps sort of suitability, know your client, and appetite for risk and availability to take loss from a private client perspective? If you've got companies where the capitalization doesn't attract institutions who will hear about after the coffee break, but actually the hurdles for a private client investment in a small company, even if they see the opportunity, and that's one of the keys. I agree with Stuart. There is a certain glasnost in terms of raising money, but actually the rules that prohibit investment for individuals actually militate them being the source of finance for, for some of these companies. And for Roberto, the bottom of your batting order was MMD. I wonder what you had to do to get down that far. <laughs> so, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Um, On, with the mic, so we can all hear? Former panellist. Sorry? Oh, pa former oh, panellist. Former panellist. Well, well, okay, great. That's a good thing. But what, what else? Do you run your own business? or? Uh, sorry, sir. Fine, okay, so sorry, thank you very much. An analyst. Um, Stuart. Um, I think I agree wholeheartedly with that. I think I've, I've made this point a number of times and I'll, I'll make it again. If you are a private client and if you hold funds with, I don't know, let's take a Williams de Bro, Investec Wealth Management nowadays, um, you, you can name them all. Generally speaking, the government forces those fund managers to run a pretty set portfolio. So you get a menu. I'm high risk, medium risk, or low risk. And then the government comes around and says, well, hang on a moment. Both these blokes are high risk, but you've selected a different portfolio. Explain. So the mindset of your average private client wealth manager is not to make too much in the way of decisions, but to run a fairly formulaic portfolio. And that doesn't leave much sort of room for discretionary trading on behalf of those clients within the portfolio, and it mitigates against investment in some of the higher risk situations. So when I say I talk about private clients returning, that doesn't mean me putting loads more money into my pension fund and leaving it for Fidelity to run. That is now me, on my own account, buying shares in the market in things that I find interesting. And I think that is a huge, huge problem in terms of the public markets at the moment, and for smaller, excuse me, smaller companies particularly. So when our team go out to raise money, and you do get interest and liquidity from private client brokers, you tend to be trying to find the one bloke within a large portfolio who is perhaps running some IHT money, or who is running some higher risk money, or actually has clients that he can go back to and say, how about this? It looks interesting. So I think that there's a lot of barriers there. D mm -hmm. Does that help? And Lawrence, you were nodding. Um, uh, similar I, issue. I, I yeah. agree with that. I think there's, you know, it's, it, I think it's, it's getting ridiculous uh, the situation now, and I think there are many new areas of regulation that have come in, particularly from our, our friends in uh, Brussels, that are uh, detrimental to the development of the investment market. And I, I, I think it's anecdotally, but I think the uh, the retail market is severely underappreciated. When you look back to the uh, financial crisis. Um, you know, the fear was palpable in the market. Everyone was dumping shares. The institutions, because of the redemptions or whatever, were having to liquidate portfolios. And um, when the turn came, uh, and as I say, it is anecdotal, I haven't got any firm evidence, but when the turn came, I believe it was the individual private client mm. buying. They, uh, and we saw uh, in the bank volumes that trading in bank shares, and I think RBS got down to 20p in the pre-consolidated form, and they were the first, really, uh, to buy for the recovery. Uh, they sensed that things had been knocked down so low, there was a recovery potential. So I think people underestimate uh, the power of the retail market and the ability of uh, the man in the street to make his own mind up and, mm -hmm. and, and do his own work. If you think of it now, <coughs> information 
is as widely available to a retail investor with access to a computer or the internet as it probably is to an institution. He may not be able to meet the, the manager that often, but he can get all the uh, statistical information. Um, uh, he sometimes can find interviews and live webcasts about companies. So uh, allow the private investors to make his own mind up. Mm -hmm. I mean, is, your, is yours, Michael, institutions-based um, investment or, or is private uh, money uh, available to you and what are the hurdles to that? Um, prior, to, prior moving to AIM, we didn't have much in institutional following. Now, now we have. Um, about 10% of the company is institutionally funded right. or institutionally shareholded. Um, this is all public knowledge, so, you know, at the end of the day, anything can be found out. Um, I myself still hold a large portion of the business and the rest is in free float or, or held between my co-directors. Um, I mean, listening to what the, what the guys were just saying, and uh, firstly, it was great that Lawrence made a mention of our film and technology, which I want to come back on, because it's rare that you can get a market maker to watch your promotional video, and uh, to have him sat there for four minutes, is, it's, uh, it's always good to do. Um, but I think what, what is happening, part of the process that we experienced whilst we were floating, was that... Um, the amount of regulation, the amount of uh, work that goes into the audit style of your business when you're getting it ready for float to bring investors on is, of course, very, very important. But I think also some of it's now coming at the cost of innovation. And I think that what is happening is that companies, especially small companies, are becoming a little strangled. I mean, AIM, AIM offers the sort of more lightly regulated than the full market and PLUS offers of sort of more lightly regulated than below. But I think when it comes to the sharing of information, if an, if an investor is going to make a decision, they've got to have every bit of information in front of them now. Um, that's widely available. Like, like Lawrence said, mm. if you've got a computer, if you know how to use it, if you don't find a, an eight-year-old that will, will teach you, um, then, then you can get all that information. It's all Great. there. And Roberto, MMD, D stands for what, disaster or uh, what? what? <laughs> the default, uh, the event that the company doesn't oh, right. pay back its debt yeah. or... or um, <laughs> yeah. Or interest. Fantastic. There you go. Is that is that covered your areas? Excellent. Thank you, sir. Uh, gentlemen are here. Who's next? Carbon, I'm going to start picking if no one puts their hand up. Can I ask? Can I ask? Yeah, yes. But, there we go. Uh, Michael's got a question. Great. Excellent. <laughs> next is next to me. That's very helpful. So. Hi. Um, my name is Matt Wood, and I run uh, CMS Corporate Consultants. We're a PLC advisory uh, company that offers accounting, legal, and corporate finance services to small companies, particularly AIM companies. Um, and we release the burden of PLC to allow them to run their businesses. My question really relates to uh, Lawrence and, and perhaps Stuart as well. You talked about the new blood coming onto AIM and how uh, the, the, the purpose of the market was to bring the smaller growing companies. But a lot of the costs associated with it, so the advisory costs, are prohibitive for small companies unless they're raising sort of upwards of five million pounds. And it was interesting to hear Michael, who raised the money when he came to AIM, but I guess in part of the, the process was easier because he'd been on plus markets and therefore a lot of the due diligence had been, had been uh, followed through there. So is there any innovative ways the advisors can think around and, and from the investors investing and therefore giving away some of their stock in fees to allow those smaller companies to access the markets when they're not raising five million pounds? So you've got very good companies out there looking for two, three, four million pounds that really when the costs of capital are 500,000 pounds to come to aim, mm. should there be some deferment of fees? Is there some other way in which without reducing the quality of the regulation and the quality of the advice will allow those companies to get access to cash. Thanks. Um, Stuart? Innovative ways. Innovative ways to cut fee. I mean, I think first and foremost, I'd say, you know, if you are a company of a reasonable size and you're looking to raise three or four million pounds, yes, there is a cost of doing that, and yes, there is a cost of joining the market. Actually, frankly, if you're raising three or four million pounds from private equity, the cost of your business is likely to be pretty similar once you've been down the DD route and everything else. I think, you know, I'm, I'm not going to stand up here and make a public pronouncement that FinCAP would be delighted to cut fees and do it on the chief, etc. I do think, and I, I have seen this, this is a market where lawyers are, generally speaking, charging less than they did 10 years ago, the costs of the exercise are probably no more than they were 10 years ago. So I don't think cost should put you off. I think if you're a business that actually is only ever going to raise four million pounds, and that's it, and that four million pounds is not going to grow the business significantly and effectively justify the investment that you're making in the listing, perhaps you shouldn't be doing it in the first place, i.e. don't look to shortcut the fees, 
but look at it as an investment and the next stage of your business grown because you can guarantee, and this is true of the A market, excuse me, and has been completely ruined on the full list, whilst it might cost you an arm and a leg, if you like, to raise four million pounds as a proportion of the cost because of the accountants, the lawyers, the broker, the nomad, the other lawyers, the PR, etc. What you are doing is making an investment so that when you come back to the market because you want to invest in your next product or the next acquisition or the next portfolio, at that point, your cost of capital in terms of raising it as opposed to the actual you know, calculations and whack and everything is considerably cheaper. At that point, it's probably a negotiation with your broker as to the percentage of funds they're going to charge. The rest of it just comes together. Um, you know, as, as a general thing, I know that there are lots of blogs out there that talk about the disproportionate cost of, of maintaining a listing. Yeah, if you're a million pound company and you've got 500,000 pounds of cash, an AIM listing is going to be very, very expensive. But frankly, if you are a million pound company with 500,000 pounds of cash, that's probably, again, not the right place for you to be. Excellent. So, so probably excellent. doesn't keep, help you, Woody, but there keep, you go. Keep paying is a good message there. Um, uh, Lawrence. Well, I'm in a privileged position in that um, we don't get any fees. Uh, we don't charge fees to, to make a market. We just sit there and uh, try to provide liquidity, so uh, enable the uh, retail investor and some institutions to uh, trade in shares. Um, I think the, the regulation creates a lot of this. There's such a lot of regulation and compliance uh, that the, um, you need the professional advisors to uh, ensure that you do comply with all of that. So that, that's where the costs come. I think the costs are very high, I think as a percentage of money is being raised. Uh, innovative ways, I think we do need new innovative ways uh, for the whole market. Uh, and, I, and I'm hoping that um, ways can be found to uh, enable companies to uh, address a wider audience, and I mean by that I mean a retail market, and allow them to participate in IPOs. If you look at the, uh, on a much bigger scale, but if you look at Direct Line, which was a recent IPO, and uh, Eshore, um, they, uh, a, a percentage was allocated for uh, retail distribution, and it went extremely well. Um, and I think uh, uh, there should be ways that could be found to enable smaller companies to also tap that market via technology platforms, the internet, whatever. Um, and I think you would find probably, uh, it, it may reduce costs or may not, but it would, it would perhaps create a, a more liquid market, a liquid aftermarket, which is good for the company. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lawrence. Now, Michael, I'm sorry that the, the clock is slightly against us, but Michael, the last question oh, is well. going to come to you. Okay, just, just very quick comments yes. on that last one. Um, one of the benefits, of course, going uh, changing markets or moving from private to was our market cap was two million. We raised it to over six. Um, so shareholder benefit was a multiple of obviously share price as well. Um, you can go to market for under five hundred thousand pounds. We put our half year numbers out just recently, excluding the brokers' commissions. It was under two hundred thousand pounds to change markets, um, and all the due diligence that we had on ICAP and ISDX. Not undermining that in any way, you have to do it all again to move markets. None of it carries over. So um, it, it is possible to do, and, and just shop around for your professionals. It can happen easily. Um, yeah, I just wanted to pick up, Lawrence mentioned earlier about um, technology and uh, business moving forward. Um, interestingly enough, Lawrence, the uh, number of smartphones that people are carrying, over 350, 400 million smartphones. Um, smart TVs, which are launching now, and whether people have got them in their homes at the moment, these are Google's numbers, not mine. $119 million has been spent, will be spent between now and the end of next year on smart TVs. Um, that figure rises to $2 billion spent by 2018 for home entertainment. Um, the technology industry, I think, is going to explode moving forward. And one of the reasons we're in the content industry is to supply all these new users with content. I mean, we're just one small player, and the majors will be having a splendid time with this because it's 24-7 on the move or otherwise. So I do believe technology, in terms of the hardware side of things, we're going to see a, a massive boom and a, and a completely different type of marketplace in the next three to four years. Well, I just want to very briefly, as I say, the clock is slightly against, very briefly just respond. I mean, you've, you've pointed out the technology um, uh, uh, a leaf, lift that will, will help the market. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, looking at our business, our, our business, um, I don't want to boast, but we're, we actually are the largest market maker by volume on the London stock market. 
Um, and we actually only have a total of 200 staff, um, and that includes all our uh, compliance, uh, back office, and technology. Um, but we are the largest, and by to enable us to be that large, we have a very, very strong technology platform. Um, some years ago, we realized to, uh, to grow the business, to leverage it, we needed that. And we have a product uh, on the broken trading side, people will know, perhaps not on the corporate side, it's called Winner. And it's a, a platform that um, uh, high volume stockbrokers can take. And so they can take our prices electronically and feed them to their client base. And it, it, it enables us to uh, carry out about 90 to 95 percent of all our transactions uh, electronically. Mm -hmm. So that has given us huge leverage in our business. Uh, so technology has been a great benefit to our business, and it's something we have to spend on very significantly every year. But it's it's very important to keep ahead of that. So I see, I can see firsthand there the impact it's had on our business. So I think the next stage possibly is in the actual allowing the retail audience to uh, access the market, to get involved in IPOs, something can be done. And I think perhaps uh, it's an area of, uh, should be an area of great interest for people involved in the market. Great. Well, look, thanks so much. Uh, I don't want to stand uh, between delegates and their coffee and tea break, very dangerous place to be. So I just want to thank uh, Lawrence, Stuart, uh, Michael, and Roberto for a fantastic panel discussion. Thank you.